on. Go. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are we doing tonight? Thank you guys for making the trip up to Jenny Jump State Park. I see we all have our masks on. I appreciate it very much. We're going to do tonight's talk live for you outside here. Bill Murray is going to be talking to you guys all about Stellafane tonight. I'm not going to give you any more information than that. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. I'm not going to tell you what goes on there. I'm going to leave that to Bill himself. If you guys do have any questions, um, try to hold them to the end of the talk. Uh, if you're able to raise your hand and Bill sees you and he can take your question, he definitely will. Porta potty is over there. If you guys do need to use it, we have hand sanitizer in there, toilet paper is in there. If you guys have some bug spray and you want to grab it before the talk starts, if you don't have it on, I'd recommend using a little bit of bug spray. Two more things. Right behind me over here, we have our sales desk. We ask that nobody go into our meeting room, and if you would like to enter our sales desk area, that you do it one at a time. And finally, after the presentation, if you head down the driveway, to the left-hand side at our second observatory, we're going to be set up there. Telescope showing you on a screen what we're looking at. Our goal tonight is to see Jupiter, Saturn. We're also going to try to take a look at the comet to see if it's not too far away to see if we can pick it up for you guys. As you know, comet has been the talk of the town the last couple weeks. Uh, it has been beautiful, especially from up here and especially naked eye. Uh, a couple days ago, it did make that turn, so it is heading back away. Hopefully we can find it tonight. And other than that, Bill Murray. Thank you, Matt. Um, normally, we give these talks inside in a much more enclosed space. So I will attempt to use my teacher voice. <laughs> and hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, if you're having trouble hearing me, please just wave your hand and say speak up or something like that. And I'll know I have to speak a little bit louder. But I will try to talk at a volume level so that everybody can hear. All right, so tonight's talk is Stellafane for Beginners. And so what is Stellafane? So Stellafane is a telescope maker convention uh, that's held every year in Springfield, Vermont. Stellafane means Shrine to the Stars. Uh, it's the home of the Springfield Telescope Makers. Springfield, Vermont is the town where it is held. And it's the oldest gathering of amateur astronomers in the United States. A three-day convention that is held uh, usually at the new moon date in July or August. And I have given this talk before as an incentive for people to actually maybe get an interest in Stellafane and take a trip up there. Uh, unfortunately, this year, uh, COVID-19 intervened, and pretty much everything has been canceled, including Stellafane. Uh, unfortunately, I plan to give this talk before I knew that. Uh, but the convention has been held every year since World War II uh, without interruption until this year, and it will definitely be held again next year. Hopefully, uh, we'll have a vaccine in place by then, and everybody can remove their mask, and we'll be back to normal. So, as I said, it's the oldest gathering of amateur astronomers in the United States. And the man who is responsible for that is this gentleman here, Russell Porter. The dates are there, 1871 to 1949. Um, amateur astronomy tends to uh, accrue people with very interesting and unusual backgrounds. And Porter is one of those people. He was born in Springfield, Vermont. And this is his hometown. He was an artist polar explorer. He went on several early missions to the North Pole. Uh, he was an architect, an engineer, and an amateur astronomer extraordinaire. And after a varied career doing all those things for a number of years, uh, he retired to his hometown in 1919. Uh, the skies over southern Vermont are usually pretty good. And during his retirement, he got an interest in amateur astronomy. And he wanted to uh, see for himself some of the wonders of the universe. Unfortunately, at that time, astronomy was a rich man's hobby. If you wanted a telescope, uh, it would probably set you back uh, a good fraction of a working man's salary at that time. So instead of buying a telescope, Porter decided to learn how to make them. And luckily, Springfield 
was one of these little industrial towns up in New England. Um, had a large number of people with mechanical backgrounds, a lot of machinists. So a lot of people with uh, good mechanical understanding and a lot of equipment to be able to build stuff. And so Porter gathered around him a group of people, uh, also in the town, who had the same interest in doing astronomy. And together they formed the Springfield Telescope Makers, uh, the astronomy club that still puts on Stellafane today and uh, has been extant since the 1920s. They originally met at what is now known as the clubhouse. This was a small vacation home a few miles outside of Springfield on a little knob called Breezy Hill that was owned by Porter's aunt. Um, uh, that was the original meeting place and observing point site for the Springfield, the, uh, Springfield telescope makers. And after his death, uh, Porter willed the property to the Springfield telescope makers and it is still the center of their club. So uh, for a number of years, the Springfield telescope makers were making telescopes in Springfield, and uh, what they were doing began to get out. And in the mid-1920s, they were contacted by this gentleman on the left here. Uh, his name was Albert Unk Ingalls. He was an editor for Scientific American magazine. He had, for a number of years, written a column which was very popular for decades called The Amateur Scientist, uh, which was a, a column that Scientific American had that detailed projects done by amateur scientists that will give you enough information to be able to do them yourselves. And Ingalls had heard about Porter and his group, and he went up to Springfield to see what they were doing. And he was extraordinarily impressed with what he saw there. And in the November 1925 issue of Scientific American, it was headlined by an article that Ingalls wrote about Porter and the Springfield Telescope Makers uh, titled, the Heavens Declare the Glory of God, which is still the motto of the club and is inscribed over the pink clubhouse. And he told about Porter and his group, um, how they were making telescopes, and he gave enough information um, that a lot of people uh, uh, became interested and started to make telescopes first in New England and then throughout the United States. And so Porter became relatively famous and his group as well. And people were contacting him all the time to get uh, hints on how to make telescopes and find out what they were doing. And uh, after no, a couple of years, um, Porter and the Springfield Telescope Makers decided to hold a summer convention for telescope makers and invite people throughout the nation. And in 1926, they had the first spring uh, Stella Day at Springfield, Club, where they invited people to come up to see what they were doing, to share ideas on telescope making. And uh, with some interruptions uh, during the Depression and World War II, uh, that convention has been going on ever since. The uh, articles that uh, Ingalls and Porter wrote in Scientific American and they wrote a number of articles on telescope making over the ensuing decades, uh, were coalesced into three books on amateur telescope making, which is still the Bible if you're interested in making your own telescope. So uh, after a number of years, uh, Porter became famous enough that he was contacted by a professional astronomer, uh, George Ellery Hale, uh, who was in the process then in the 19 early 1930s to 1940s, of building the largest telescope in the world, which was the 200-inch uh, Palomar Telescope, which is still out in California. And he asked Porter to create some engineering drawings of the mounting for that telescope. And Porter, since he was an artist, went out to California to do that. And what he created are now known as the famous cutaway drawings of the mount of the Palomar Telescope. Uh, they are Besides being extraordinarily detailed and beautiful engineering drawings, they're basically considered major works of art. Uh, the originals of Porter's drawings, if you can find them, many are, are in museums, can go for several hundred thousand dollars these days. Okay. While he was out in California, he undertook another major project uh, because he was an architect, 
and helped to design the Griffith Planetarium and Observatory in Los Angeles, uh, which has been the site of many movies over the years since then. So what is it like to actually go to Celebrate? I've been going uh, with a few interruptions since the early 1990s. Uh, and uh, I try to go every year because it's one of the more interesting places to go if you're an amateur astronomer. So it's just outside of uh, Springfield, Vermont, uh, which is just off of Route 91 north going into Vermont. Uh, you take exit 7, get off at Springfield, go through the town, and head out the other side. And you start taking this winding road up into the hills uh, just beyond Springfield. And initially, it's a nice suburban neighborhood with nice paved roads. And then the houses start to get thinner. And then the houses disappear. And then the road becomes rough. And then it becomes unpaved. And just about the time you're wondering whether you should have brought a four-wheel drive vehicle to get up there, you see this, which is the waiting line to get into Stellafen which can be up to a mile long. There's only one road into the place. And so you sp spend a little bit of time in your car uh, as the line inches forward until finally, oops, sorry about that. You see the sign that tells you you've arrived at Stella. When you finally make it to the gate, uh, you stop there, you pick up all the information for the convention, including your uh, 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 camping permit. Uh, you don't have to camp at Stellafane. Uh, you can get accommodations in the town uh, and have about a 20, 20 minute drive up to Stellafane after that. Uh, but I've been camping every time that I've been there uh, because I like to be close to the action. So um, the site itself is a little bit broken and that uh, is part of the history of Stellafane itself. The original clubhouse owned by the, uh, the uh, Sprinkle Telescope Makers is located right here. And uh, that was originally the only territory uh, that was owned by the Sprinkle Telescope Makers. As the convention became more and more popular throughout the years, and the numbers of people coming to it went from dozens to hundreds, uh, the last time I was there, there were 1,500 people there. Um, they needed a camping field, and so there was a small open field just down the road from the clubhouse that they used for a good number of years, um, but they didn't own that property. And in the 1980s, uh, the person who did own that property sold it to a guy who wanted to use it as a tree farm, and at that time it looked like uh, Stella Bank was going to end permanently because there would be no place to parole old people to camp. But several members of the Springfield Telescope Makers and other people who had come to love Stellafane over the years actually took out second mortgages on their houses and got enough money together to buy a piece of property about 10 acres, which is about a quarter of a mile away, which is now known as Stellafane East. And then a number of years ago, they added to that property another section. Uh, all told, I think it's about 30 acres that they own, and that's more than enough to accommodate people who want to camp there into the future. So Stellafane is going to be around for quite a while. So the uh, question always arises, is Stellafane a star party or a telescope convention? So what are each of them? So uh, if you look up in the literature for amateur astronomers, uh, Sky and Telescope Magazine, Astronomy Magazine, You'll see a number of star parties listed throughout the year when we don't have an odd, le odd year like we do this year. And these are places where amateur astronomers can go for either long weekends or periods of time of up to the week to places where light pollution is non-existent. Um, out into central Pennsylvania is a, a good one called the Cherry Springs Star Party. Um, if you want to get really dark skies, you go out west to West Texas or the Rocky Mountains. Rocky Mountains of Canada or another place where people go. And amateur astronomers will gather in these places for four to ten days and spend the time looking at the stars under skies where you can actually see a lot of things. Stellafane is not officially a star park. It's a telescope. Department. So the main emphasis there is talking about telescoping. 
doesn't mean they don't do observing. They do. But if the skies tend to be bad, which is not unknown in southern Vermont, you can get the monsoon through, and you can have days where the rain doesn't stop for a week. Um, there is something else to do. There's workshops, there's talks, um, there's uh, demonstrations, a lot of different things to do so that you don't lose a weekend uh, and have to drive six to seven hours to get up there and not have anything to do. So the heart of Stella Fame is Pink Club House, uh, Porter's aunt's original house, which is still owned by the Springfield Telescope Makers. Uh, the interior decor is still circa 1920s, 1930s. Um, it has a lot of memorabilia from people who have gone, been through uh, Stella Fane over the years, including a lot of famous people. Um, they actually have a couple of moon rocks up there that were donated by Apollo astronauts to Stella Fane. And uh, the question always arises, why is it pink? And the apocryphal story is uh, the house needed some work back in the 1930s, and it needed to be repainted. And 1930s was the Great Depression. Nobody had any money. So uh, they sprinkled telescope makers, started asking around town to see if they could get some donations of free paint. And they could get a donation of white paint, but it wasn't enough to complete the house. And they could get a donation of red paint, but it wasn't enough to complete the house. So the solution became obvious. They took both donations, mixed the paint together, the house is pink, and it's been pink ever since. So this is the view from the porch of the clubhouse. Uh, the weather is very uh, changeable up in Vermont. Uh, you can get bad days, but sometimes, occasionally, uh, the weather gods will smile on you and you get a day like this, which is when I was there in 2016. Uh, about 77 degrees, light breeze, sunny, absolutely beautiful day. Great time to be in Vermont in the summertime. This is looking out from the clubhouse out of Scott, which is about 20 miles away. So one of the things that's very interesting about Stellafane being a telescope convention is you get to see designs of telescopes that you never see anywhere else because people are very inventive in solving the problems that go along with amateur astronomy. For instance, this is a telescope. It is a telescope. It was actually built by Russell Porter in 1930. Okay. He wanted to do observing from the clubhouse in the wintertime. Uh, it can get a little bit cold in Vermont in the wintertime. Uh, and so he wanted, didn't want to be outside to do that. He wanted the comfort of, of observing inside. So he designed and built this structure, which is called Porter's Turret Telescope. It's actually a building and a telescope at the same time. So. Uh, there are two mirrors that concentrate and reflect the light. There's one mirror here, which takes the light from the sky and bounces it to another mirror here. And then back to that mirror, there's a hole cut in it, and the light goes into this hemisphere. And inside the hemisphere is an eyepiece, so you can sit inside the building in the warmth and actually observe anywhere in the sky uh, during the wintertime without having to be outside. Okay. That Porter's Turret Telescope is still operational. Every Stella thing, they have it operational during the day they do solar observing, and they use it at night for astronomical mm -hmm. observing. So the part of the, uh, the Stella Fane Convention that's known as Stella Fane East, the new property they, they bought, also has several unique observatories on it. Um, this is a view from the bottom of the field near the tree tent. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is the McGregor Observatory and the Domed Observatory. This is the bunkhouse there. And then from the McGregor Observatory looking down, this is the Domed Observatory. I usually set up my telescope when I bring a telescope up in this area because it has the best open skies of the whole Stellafane Convention. So camping in Stellafane. Uh, I said I usually do camp, and I have. Uh, if you decide to do that, be aware that the camping is simple, rustic, uh, pretty rough. Um, there is water available. There's no electricity. Um, so uh, if you have a tent, uh, you're welcome to set it up. 
uh, can be kind of close at quarters because uh, the camping areas are a little bit narrow. Um, so people are kind of packed together. One of the reasons why they canceled it this year. This is the area that I like to camp. It's called Pine Island. It's a little uh, pine uh, area, piney area um, that's in the shade. Uh, and so it's a little bit cooler than other areas around. Uh, my tent from 2016. Uh, so you can see it is kind of a simple camping area. If you do have RVs, you can bring them. Um, but that costs more to get in with an RV. And you have to arrive a little bit earlier because they're going to park your RV in the area for RVs probably won't be able to get out before the end of the convention, but you can bring it if you have it. So this is the McGregor Observatory up at the top of the hill on Skullfine East. Uh, it's a unique observatory in that it houses a 13-inch Schuchman telescope, which is the kind of telescope that uses both lenses and mirrors, the folded path telescope. Uh, for a number of years, it was the largest Schuchman-style telescope in the world. It has been surpassed since then, but it's still like the second or third largest one in the world. Below the uh, regular observatory is the domed observatory, which contains a 10-inch Ritchie Crichton telescope on a Springfield fence. So uh, you'll see when you go to our observatories and look in at the telescopes, there are a number of different ways to mount a telescope so it will track the stars. The two most common ones you see today are called German equatorial mounts or fork mounts. But uh, Porter wanted a mount where the eyepiece would always remain in the same location. And he created that, and that mount is called today the Springfield mount. Uh, it's not very popular in terms of uh, commercial telescopes that you buy today. But it does have the advantage that the eyepiece is always in the same location. So it's a very good telescope for people with disabilities because you don't have to climb a ladder or put your body in some sort of weird position to be able to look through the eyepiece of the telescope. It's always in a nice position where you can stay seated and look through the eyepiece, no matter where the telescope is pointed. So this is the food tent at Stellafane. Surprisingly, the food is actually pretty good. Um, there is a restaurant at uh, a town uh, about 20 or 30 miles away from Stellafane. Uh, and they had a long association with the Springfield Telescope Makers. So every cellophane week, July and August, they close down their operation at the restaurant and pack everything up and bring everything up to cellophane and essentially reopen their restaurant at cellophane uh, for the week the cellophane is going. Uh, prices are reasonable. Another view of the food tent. Uh, two cellophane traditions, uh, one that's been going on since I don't know when, it's, it's been, as long as I've been going, it's been there. It's Saturday evening, the chicken dinner, and get a half a roast chicken for dinner. And they started a new tradition a few years ago. Friday evening dinner is a clam bake. And you can get both of these uh, if you, you're interested in them. You don't have to. Uh, it costs a little bit extra. When you register for Telescelfang, you can also register for these dinners as well. So this is the bunkhouse, which is just behind the food tank where they sell cellophane memorabilia, t-shirts, uh, hats, uh, mugs, uh, bumper stickers, uh, other types of clothing as well. And also where you get uh, your tickets for the Saturday night raffle, which is one of the most famous raffles in amateur astronomy. So at cellophane, because there's such an emphasis on uh, DIY projects and uh, building your own telescope, they don't allow any commercial vendors for the weekend. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not there. It just means they're not selling their gear while they're there. So all of the commercial vendors, the people who actually uh, own the companies that te sell telescopes, most of them go to Stellafane because they learn their love of astronomy and telescopes and how to make telescopes. Many of them learned it going to Stellafane. And to pay that back, a lot of them bring up some very nice door prices for uh, the cellophane raffle, uh, including Al Nagler, who is one of the major telescope manufacturers in the United States for uh, very fine refractors. And he's also known for having probably the best telescope eyepieces that you can buy. 
Uh, the views you get through them are astronomical. The prices are also astronomical. Uh, you can uh, easily spend six, seven, eight hundred dollars for one of Nagler's eyepieces. And the, the door, the main prize of the raffle, he takes a gift, a grab bag, and puts five or six of his best eyepieces in there. The total value of it is close to three thousand dollars, and that's the main prize for the evening. So you see people up at the, the bunkhouse buying just reams and reams and reams of raffle tickets for the raffle on Saturday night, trying to win the Nagler lottery and uh, save themselves a good couple of thousand dollars in buying eyepieces. Another newer building at Cellophane is the Flanders Pavilion. Uh, so this is a large indoor area where during the day on Friday and Saturday, um, they held talks and demonstrations and workshops uh, all about telescope making and projects in astronomy. Uh, you don't have to be a professional to give a talk there. If you have an interesting topic, you just tell them uh, on your way in and they'll put you on the schedule. And you can give a talk about uh, any interesting project that you did, a trip that you made to see an eclipse, uh, some sort of telescope that you're building, uh, and it's a really interesting venue for people who are interested in trying to do uh, things on their own in the front. And also telescope making. So telescope making is the heart of the Springfield Telescope Makers, and they have workshops at Cellophane where you can grind your own mirror for your own telescope. Essentially, start with a blank and end up with a finished mirror at the end. They'll take you through the whole process to do it. And let's see if I can do this. younger version of me uh, in the, the mid-1990s at Stella Fame, uh, taking a master class in mirror grinding from another very interesting character uh, in the history of amateur astronomy right there. And his name was John Dobson. Uh, Dobson has one of the more unique stories uh, in the history of amateur astronomy. He was uh, born in China to American missionaries there, uh, returned to the United States when he was a teenager to complete his education, um, finished a degree in chemistry right about the beginning of World War II, and was asked to join the Manhattan Project, and said at that time, no, I don't think I want to do that. I'm going to join a Hindu monastery in California instead, which wasn't a real you know, major career choice for young Americans in the early 1940s, but it worked for Dobson. And so he spent a number of years in the monastery. And in the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, he became fascinated by astronomy and wanted to see the universe for himself. So he wanted to get a telescope. Uh, Hindu monks usually don't have a lot of disposable income. So he had to build one himself out of pretty much any junk that he could find. So he went down, he, he was outside of San Francisco uh, went down to the harbor, was able to find some porthole gap blast from old ships, used that to, for his mirror blanks to grind his mirrors, used sauna tube uh, from building projects as the uh, tube for his telescope, scrap lumber, um, scrap hardware around, and he didn't mean to do this, he just spent 
make a telescope for himself, but he ended up revolutionizing amateur astronomy because what he did was he created a new type of telescope which is now known after him called the Dobsonian Telescope. And for the first time, amateur astronomers had access to really, really large telescopes at reasonable prices because essentially there's nothing to this telescope except the mirror at the end, which he made himself. Everything else was pretty much junk. And if you buy one of these commercially these days, they're much cheaper than any other type of telescope that you can see. You may see some Dobsonian telescopes on the field tonight. I'm not sure. We'll see. So Dobson has been had been a fixture at Cellophane for a good number of years. So uh, I was there in, uh, I believe it was 1995, and he was giving the master class in mirror making. So here's me behind him. It's a little bit hard to see. And there I am helping him pour a pitch lap to help polish a mirror. So after you finish grinding a mirror for a telescope uh, and you want to polish it so that it's ready to have be aluminized, uh, you take molten pitch and pour it onto the tool and then use that uh, with some uh, uh, corundum uh, on the, the pitch. Slowly polish the mirror until it's a flat surface. So we're pouring the pitch lap here. And then Dobson is using a ruler cut grooves in the pitch lap, something that only he did. Um, you look at telescope making books, they have a very complicated procedure for making a pitch lap. It looks like it can take hours to do. Um, Dobson was able to make one in less than 10 seconds. Okay. So he was the master on how to make the wrong telescope. And a uh, very interesting year when I was a Stella fan and got to take the classroom. So the heart of, tele of Stella Fain is the telescope competition, which is held on Friday and Saturday and Saturday evening. So if you make a telescope, you can actually bring it to, te to cellophane to show off and enter in their competition. Um, there are two classes. You can enter for mechanical construction or for optical excellence. Um, this is actually not a telescope that was entered there. This is Russell Porter's original Springfield Mount Telescope, which is still owned by the Springfield Telescope Makers. But one of the neat things about Stellafane and the telescope competition is you get to see stuff that you never see anywhere else. Because people are extremely inventive and they create stuff that you just have no idea that anybody would go and make them. So for instance, this is a gentleman who made this telescope, which is a full scale working reproduction copy of the telescope that the astronomer William Herschel used to discover the planet Uranus in 1781. That telescope is still excellent over in England. And so this guy went over there, took a look at it, created some plan drawings, and then created a model of it. Uh, and brought it back to Stellafane for the competition. This type of telescope is called a Scheifspiegel. It's a reflecting telescope, so it uses mirrors but in a folded path, so the light goes like this, okay? Uh, much longer focal length than normally you would see in a reflector. Very good for planetary observing. This design is very similar to the Schuppmann telescope in the McGregor Observatory, but much smaller. The Schuppmann is 13 inches uh, mirror. This one is only about two or three inches, I believe. So here's a telescope, another folded retracting telescope on a mount made of wood and piping. Okay. Another telescope on a fork type mounting, that's a Newtonian telescope, uh, made of wood, mostly wood and metal, all handmade. Sometimes you see telescopes that are not only you know, beautiful mechanically, but also works of art as well. So this gentleman made a telescope, all hand carved wood and painted and finished, uh, working telescope. Very nice to look at. And then you see stuff that you said, I would have never thought of that. So you see a guy who wants to have a telescope mounting and he made the mounting out of a bowling ball. Okay. Another person carved a chess set 
for all the chess pieces or telescopes, observatories, or have an astronomical connotation to it. Okay. Very nice Dobsonian telescope, uh, very nicely made. Finished. This is an amateur, so this is her first telescope. She made this telescope. It's the first one she ever made. Another beautiful folded refracting telescope. You get to see telescope designs that you really never see anywhere else other than stellar things because these type of telescopes uh, are not sold commercially. And then you get to see stuff occasionally, you know, I'm, I'm always expecting to see very interesting things like this, but occasionally you see something that just completely blows you away. And I got a chance to see that in 2016. So a little bit of a backstory. So this is a picture of Alvin Clark. Uh, in the 19th century, he was the main American manufacturer of telescopes. He manufactured small telescopes for rich amateurs, as well as the largest refractors, refracting telescopes that use lenses in the world, including what is still the largest refractor in the world at Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, and the 36-inch refractor at Lick Observatory out in California. So he was the major American telescope maker back 130, 140 years ago. One of the telescopes that he made was an 8-inch F-15 refractor, which lived for many years at the Seagraves Observatory in Rhode Island. In the late 1990s, um, that telescope had become derelict. It was no longer functional. And several members of the uh, um, Astronomical Society of New Haven took on the multi-year project of completely disassembling the telescope cleaning all the parts that could be cleaned, remanufacturing the parts that needed to be remanufactured, re cleaning the lenses, and then reassembling. So this is Alvin Clark's 8-inch refractor at the Seagrave Observatory as it exists today, fully functional. During that project, two of the members of the uh, Astronomical Society of New Haven took the drawings that were made. They created hundreds of pages of drawings of every part of that telescope. And they took those drawings and decided to make a three-quarter copy of this telescope and brought it up to sell it. So this is a three-quarters copy, so a six-inch F-15 refracting telescope, uh, completely handmade, every single part machine by hand. And back in the 19th century, telescopes today uh, generally track the stars using motors that are electrical. They didn't have those back in the 19th century. So if you had a telescope that was driven, it was driven by mechanical weights, like the weights in an old grandfather clock. They were attached to clock mechanisms, and that's what this telescope has. It has a fully working clock mechanism drive. A little bit of a close-up view of that. And if they get this to work. Fully functional. So this is, I just, I, I saw this up at Cellophane, and I just spent basically an hour staring at it. It was so amazing. I've never seen anything like this before. Okay. Absolutely one of the most beautiful telescopes I've ever seen. But then the question arises, so the two guys who did this, um, uh, Richard uh, Paul and Alan Hill, I believe, their names were, spent doing this project. So the question arises, at the end of that seven-year project, who gets to keep the telescope? <laughs> well, you know, if you're this mechanically inclined, the answer is easy. He built two of them, and they brought both of them up to cellophane. These telescopes tied for first place in the uh, optical excellence category and the mechanical category. And I don't think that that is an extremely rare occurrence to get a telescope that wins both at the same time. But this year, these two did. So another cellophane tradition okay, are the swap tables on Saturday morning. Um, so people set up uh, in an area a little bit of away from the camping fields, uh, about a half an acre, where they set up um, uh, dozens and dozens of tables and bring out every piece of junk from their basement that you could ever imagine. So if you're looking for something for building a telescope, you go to the swap tables on Saturday morning. Officially, they're not open until 
7 o'clock in the morning, but people start showing up to set up around 5, and people start showing up to grab the good stuff around 5 as well. So uh, you, if you get there by 7, some of the good stuff may be already gone. In most cases, um, it's a lot of junk, but interesting junk. So uh, if you, even if you don't pick up anything there uh, for a song, you get to see some stuff that you haven't seen before, including, you know, full telescopes that are for sale, if you're interested. And occasionally, there's a diamond in the rough. So this is a fully refurbished set of Brandon eyepieces. Um, before Al Nagler was around, creating his high power eyepieces. This, these were the best eyepieces that you could buy from like the 1940s or 1950s. And sets like this essentially don't exist anymore. Uh, very rare you see one. Occasionally you see one or two eyepieces for sale. A full set like this almost never. So I think this got snatched up pretty quickly. And then finally, Saturday evening is the Saturday evening presentation, very famous as Telefang. This is where the raffle is held, and it's also where the keynote address is held. Uh, their speakers are extremely good. Uh, we've had, in the times that I've been there, um, uh, Alan Hale, who discovered the comet Hale Bach in uh, the late 1990s, gave a talk on comet hunting. Um, uh, the two guys, I can't remember their names at the moment, for the principal investigators for the New Horizons uh, mission to Pluto. Uh, gave talks for several years on the, the mission and the discoveries that they made at the planet Pluto. Uh, the Apollo astronaut Alan Bean gave a talk about what it was like to walk on the moon. And uh, a couple of years ago, not too long, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson from the American Museum of Natural History came up to give a talk about Stargazing. So very interesting Saturday evening talk and you bring all your raffle tickets to see whether you won the major prize for the eyepieces or not. So last up, uh, what about observing a cellophane? Well, as I said, the weather in Vermont can be kind of a hit or miss thing. I've been up there years when the monsoon came in, and it's essentially four days of rain. You never see the sun. But at least you have the workshops and the presentations and the talks to go to. Uh, so you don't miss out. But when the skies are good, it's still a thing. They are spectacular. Some of the best skies in the eastern United States. Uh, and I've been up there more often than not. You get at least one or two nights of observing up there. And it's a real treasure to get out on these skies that look like this. Because in New Jersey, you don't see skies. This is a picture of the Veil Nebula that was taken at Stellafane. And also recently, another recent addition, is uh, Larry Mitchell, who is one of the people who runs the Texas Star Party down in near Fort Davis, Texas, uh, has also been going to Stellafane and created the Stellafane Observing Contest. So if you bring a telescope to Stellafane, you can enter his contest, uh, try to observe, uh, I think it's, he has like 30 objects, you have to observe 20 of them and you get a pin that says you're a Stellafane observer if you do that. So as I said, we're in an odd year. Uh, Stellafane would have been in about two weeks, uh, except uh, COVID intervened. But it is on for next year. So next year, Stellafane from Thursday, uh, August 5th, to Sunday, August 8th. The entry per person is about $70 per person, so it's pretty reasonable. Uh, that includes the, uh, the early registration. Uh, if you want to come in on Friday instead, you can take about $15 off that price. And if you're interested, uh, HTTPS slash colon colon stellafane.org convention, or just Google Stellafane, and you'll find everything else that you want to know about. And that is our talk this evening. If anybody has any questions, thank you. I'd be happy to answer them for you. Otherwise, getting a little bit dark and it may even be clear. So we can get out and actually do some observing tonight. Okay. Thank you for coming. And uh, the uh, uh, shop is over here and please leave a donation. If you feel so. Thank you again. Thank you.